about uh, Engaged HR. Uh, at Engaged HR, we are proud to be a human resource management consulting firm like no other. In 2011, we were born out of a passion for transforming workplaces into places where people are happy and engaged, where everyone is working together towards a common goal, and where people are happy to come to work every day. You know, the perfect workplace for organization and culture. Our services cover the entire employee life cycle, and over the years, we've grown to now serve over 300 organizations from coast to coast with our day-to-day -day HR needs, as well as specialized projects and on-demand support. You can learn more about Engage HR at engagedhr.com. I will now introduce our panelists this morning. Um, first, Damon. Uh, Damon Palin is from CPCM & Co. Uh, Damon is born and raised in Victoria, BC, and has been with CPCM & Co. since January 2001. Damon takes a unique approach in dealing with his clients in that he doesn't have the billable hour model and is more than just a compliance-based accountant. He is an entrepreneur himself. He prides himself on being an external CFO for his clients, looking at all aspects of their business, not just the numbers. Damon is married and has two kids, and in his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his family, golfing, and traveling. Uh, Denise, who's also my partner in Engaged HR, is the founder and CEO of Engaged HR, and she has been in human resources field for over 25 years. Denise, Denise has a wide array of leadership experience, including building Engaged HR, the very successful Victoria-based HR consulting firm that operates across Canada. Denise's innovative and solution-focused approach creates great places to work. She holds a Master of Arts in, in Leadership from Royal Woods University and the prestigious designation of Fellow Chartered Professional in Human Resources. Uh, and now, just to get started with our main webinar, I'm going to pass things over to Damon, who is going to be talking about the various federal support programs available to employers. Uh, Damon? Great, thanks, Ari. Um, I'm going to go through sort of the, there's four kind of main programs that, uh, that the CRA has put out. Um, there's the CBO, which is the Canadian Emergency Business Account Loan. Um, there's the Qs, which is the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy. There's the 10% uh, Temporary Wage Subsidy. And then there's the CERB, which is the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. Um, with respect to the uh, business loan, it's a government-backed loan that is administered through your bank, um, your corporate bank. You must have a corporate bank account in place in order to apply. Uh, the maximum amount of the loan value is $40,000 with a potential of $10,000 being forgiven uh, at a later date. The $10,000 uh, that is forgiven or 25% of the loan, uh, the, the max is ten dollars uh, can be forgiven if it's uh, repaid by a certain time frame. The loan is interest-free up until December 31st, 2022. Uh, in order to qualify, you have had to have had payroll on box 14 of your T4 summary in 2019 of at least $20,000 up to a maximum of $1.5 million. So if you are a large corporation and your payroll's over $1.5 million, then you're not eligible for the loan. Uh, this loan is for uh, businesses to help with working capital and operating expenses. Um, some of these expenses are include or are not limited to payroll, rent, utilities, insurance, property taxes, and regular service debt payments. Um, there are uh, strict regulations in terms of what you can use this money for. You cannot use it for prepaying existing loans. So if you've got a loan and you wanted to pay it down more aggressively, you're not allowed to do that. Um, you can't use it for dividends or increased management compensation. Uh, if you have regular management compensation that you're unable to, to meet um, and you need the 40000 then that is okay. We're not sure how this is going to get audited. Um, you know, if you have a bank account of hundred grand and you put in 40000 uh, after getting the loan and then, you know, you go down to pay, you know, your loan uh, maybe more aggressively, we're not sure how the CRA is going to determine, you know, which funds are coming out. Is it a first in, first out basis? So we're, we're just not clear, but I think to be very safe, you want to try to keep those funds segregated if at all possible. Um, the penalties with respect to this loan are uh, quite stiff. They can get upwards of 225% and or prison time. So you want to be, make, you want to be very sure that you're not gaming the system. 
Um, I have heard some uh, people going back and amending, you know, if they've been paid dividends, they'd go back and amend and create a T4 and late file it. Uh, to me, that's, that's super risky. So I, I wouldn't advise doing anything uh, like that. Um, so the next program is the, the, the Q's as we'll call it. The, the acronym is Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy. I'm just gonna talk a, briefly about this one as I'll get into more detail um, after I talk about the remaining programs. This is essentially the 75% uh, wage subsidy um, and is, is not limited to small corps. Um, it's, it's basically all corps, uh, all Canadian controlled private corporations. Um, and I, I believe also the public companies are eligible for this. I, I should have noted actually in the, in the um, for the business loan aspect of things, you do have to, uh, sorry, wrong point. <laughs> um, with the wage subsidy, this, uh, this is not a straight, straightforward calculation. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, going forward. The other, or a third program is the 10% temporary wage subsidy. This was the first program that got released by the feds uh, when this whole pandemic hit. Um, essentially, there's a, a period of March 18th to June uh, 19th, 2020, that this wage subsidy encapsulates. And there's a, a maximum of $1,375 per employee uh, and 20, uh, 25000 per employer that can be claimed. Um, you do have to be, obviously, a, a Canadian company. One nuance that is, is kind of uh, different is that you have to have had small business limit allocation. What that means is you had to have paid low rate tax uh, in 2019. For companies that have multiple companies that are associated or, or groups that have multiple companies, you, you would have to check with your accountant to, to see whether or not you qualify. Um, and it's not sort of... Uh, clearly stated on the webpage, so you gotta be careful with that. Um, this 10% subsidy is not cash in hand. This 10% wage subsidy is, is essentially a reduction in the amount of the uh, CPP, EI, and tax that you can pay, uh, you know, that you pay for your source deductions on a monthly basis. So you can claim it for, you know, the payroll period in which uh, you know, your, your wages fell between March 18th and June 19th. So for instance, if you had payroll in March and you made source deductions April 15th, you could have reduced those source deductions by, you know, whatever the calculated amount is. Um, it's not, the CRA is not going to turn around and write you a check for that. Um, so as a result of some complaining and stuff that the taxpayers had, the CRA obviously came out with the 75% wage subsidy to sort of complement this 10% wage subsidy. There is another option in order to claim the, uh, these, this credit of source deductions and you can do it when you go to file your T4s at the end of the year. And the CRA would, you know, if you otherwise had say $100,000 of um, source deductions that needed to be remitted and you calculated, well, I, I should have got $10,000 reduction, they will apply that credit to the next year's T4s, the 2021 T4s. Uh, the um, the next next one is uh, is the CERB um, and that's the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. So this is essentially a taxable benefit of uh, two thousand dollars per month um, for up to a sixteen week period uh, for eligible workers that have lost their income uh, or reduced income as a result of the pandemic. So you needed to have had employment income, which now includes eligible or sorry, ineligible dividends of at least $5,000 in 2019 or 12 months prior to when you applied for it. So what that kind of means is, is when it first came out, they just said you had to have employment income. And, and what had happened was a lot of business owners and people that were affected by this said, hey, this isn't fair. I pay myself in dividends. Why am I being penalized? for taking a different form of remuneration from my company. And so the, the CRA then changed it and said, okay, well, you could have up to, or you have to have had at least 5,000 of payroll or uh, self-employment income or eligible, or sorry, ineligible dividends uh, in order to, to meet that criteria. 
Uh, you can't be on EI and the CERB at the same time. So you gotta be a little bit careful. Um, the, essentially the CERB was brought in to help people that were not otherwise eligible for EI as, as business owners, unless you opt into EI, uh, you, can't, you can't get it. Uh, and once you opt in, then you, you can't opt out. So a lot of business owners just don't even bother with it. So this was meant to sort of help the self-employed person uh, get through this pandemic. Um, it is a possible that you can receive provincial assistance depending on your jurisdiction that you uh, operate in, that you could get the provincial and the CERB, uh, but you have to be careful of that depending on, uh, like I said, uh, depending on your province that you're in. Um, as a courtesy, I'd remind your, employee, your employees, if they have re received the CERB, that no tax is being withheld on this CERB. And the employees will have to report this as personal income on their tax return in 2021. So you may want to talk to your employees about, you know, maybe increasing uh, withholding taxes once they come back to work in order to help them sort of manage their cash flow so they don't get into a tax crunch come April 2021. Because I think a lot of people just think, well, I'll take the whole eight grand. It's from the government. I don't got to pay tax on it. Not the case. They will get their money come hell or high water. Um, so an overview of the, I'm going to get back to the, the sort of the details on, on the Canadian emergency, um, wage subsidy, the 75%, just as a, as a, as a preface to this, this is a, this is not a straightforward calculation. The CRA has not made this easy to, to navigate. Uh, so when at all possible, I would look to, uh, to calling on your, your professionals, that you're dealing with in order to help you get through this because the penalties with this are similar in um, with the loan, you know, up to 225%. If fraudulent uh, or if they can prove that you were fraudulent, um, there is 25% of the loan if not fraudulent, but then there's, you know, there's also prison time if it's, if you're deemed to be gaming the system as they, as they say. So essentially there's a maximum of $847 per week per eligible employee that can be um, that can be received. There's no max for the employer. So, you know, like with the, with the 10% wage subsidy, there's a max of 25% per employer. There's no max for this one. So if you are entitled to say 150,000 for your company, because you have a lot of payroll, you would get, you know, you could get the 150,000. Um, there is a, excuse me, there's a revenue reduction test that must be met. I'll kind of get to that a little bit later. Um, there are three periods currently that are being, um, that are being used to uh, handle the subsidy. So basically March 15th to April 11th is your first period. April 12th to May 9th is your second period and May 10th to June 6th is your third period. Um, we, we don't know if this is gonna get extended. Um, things are changing you know, sort of by the hour or daily with the CRA. So I think you just got to make sure you're staying up with, you know, the news releases and, and CRA's website to see if this gets extended. But as of right now, it, it only goes up to June 6th. So the, this 75% wage calculation is not in addition to the 10% wage, uh, temporary wage subsidy that I spoke about earlier. Um, the 75% is meant to be the maximum amount of subsidy that one can get from the government. So in order to meet this revenue test, you have to have uh, a dip in revenue of 15% in, in March and 30% in April and 30% in May. Uh, originally it was 30% in March and then the CRA said, no, um, we're going to, we're going to knock that down to 15 because the pandemic essentially didn't start till mid March. So that that's been updated. Um, in order to figure out your, what the reduction relates to, there's a couple different ways you can do it. One is you can relate, you know, March of 2019 to March of 2020 to see if you uh, ha meet that 15% reduction uh, in revenue. People were saying, well, hey, that's not fair. You know, maybe my business is seasonal or whatever it's going to be. So what they did is they brought in a second method of, of calculating this. And what that method is, is essentially you can take the average of January and February uh, of 2020, take the average of that revenue. And if March is down 
more than 15% of in that calculation, then you, you, you're eligible. Um, there's a, another method of calculating, uh, in addition to, you know, sort of the revenue calculation that I talked about is you can, you can apply what's called the cash method of calculating this or the accrual method. And what that means is that when you do your, your books, most businesses, I'd say 98% of businesses in Canada have to report on the accrual method, meaning if I bill you in, in February, uh, but I don't receive the money till April, I recognize that revenue in February because that's when the invoice went out. What CRA has, you know, came up with is they said, look, you could have billed a whole bunch in February, but because of the pandemic, you didn't collect anything in March and April. Therefore, you know, you could use the cash method or what you actually received in cash in March and April to say, well, hey, I, I billed all of this, this amount in February, but I didn't get any cash yet. So what they're trying to do is, is help out the people that, you know, are cash strapped. When you look at these two different methods of calculating, so you've got cash and accrual, you have to be consistent in period one, two, and three with what you're doing. So you can't have period one as cash, period two is accrual, and period three is cash again. You have to pick and choose and stay with it. Um, same with, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> same with the, the comparison test. So if you're looking at March of 2019 and March of 2020, then you have to look at April of 19 and April of 20 and May of you know, 19 and May of 20. If you do the average of January and February, you, you have to do that consistently for periods one, two, and three. So there's, as you can tell, there's a bunch of different permutations here that you can use to, to generate, you know, your calculation and to, to figure out if you are in fact eligible for the program. Um, now, it should be mentioned that even though, you know, as I said earlier, all businesses are, or most businesses are required to, to do their books on the accrual method, this cash and accrual method is only for the purposes of calculating your eligibility for the wage subsidy. So it's not like you, you all of a sudden start changing your books in, in terms of how you're recording things. It's just for this calculation. Should be noted also, if you're using QuickBooks Online, there are actually, when you run reports, there's a toggle button on the top right in QuickBooks Online where you can toggle between cash and accrual method. So I, I found that to be very handy for, for businesses rather than having to, to go back and sort of manually recalculate everything, which can be pretty uh, labor intensive. Um, also with respect to qualification, if you qualify for the first period, you automatically qualify for the second period, but you don't qualify for the third period. You have to, you know, re-qualify. So you want to, want to make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're going through sort of the eligibility for each period. Um, the subsidy calculation, the CRA has provided a web, uh, a spreadsheet on their website. I'd highly recommend using that. I would make sure that you know any of these documents that you're you're coming up with in order to support your calculation are printed and date stamped. Reason being that if you go back and and you know there's there's bookkeeping changes or people are posting journal entries after the fact, you need to have supporting documentation uh, that is you know either printed to PDF or in hard copy that is purely in a separate folder for uh, this, these subsidy calculations. So in the event of an audit you're making this as, as easy for the CRA auditor uh, to navigate through. Um, you know, so how did you calculate your revenue? Printing your general ledgers of cash and, and revenues, um, you know, printing your payroll reports, you know, any documentation that you need in order to support, support whether or not employees are eligible because I'll get to that in the, in, in the next minute or two. Having all these, you know the audits are coming and, and we don't want to suscept ourselves to penalties. Um, there are special rules for non arm's length employees like owners or uh, people that are related to owners of the businesses. So just be careful in your calculations that you're not getting aggressive with this. I've heard some people saying, oh, well, I'm all of a sudden going to go now on payroll uh, just because I was on dividends before and I'm, I'm going to you know, work the system. Be very careful because if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, now, the, the one thing that I, I found out yesterday actually is, is on the 75% wage calculation, when you go to submit, they ask you for your 10% wage calculation. Even if you didn't apply for it, 
you have to put in what you would have been eligible for for that 10 percent what the cra is now doing is they're taking that 10 percent they're going to apply it to your payroll source deduction account and only write you a check for the delta meaning the 65 percent amount so it's, it's kind of misleading um, that they're going to send you a check for the whole 75 percent this could you know cause cash flow issues for business owners so you need to be aware that if you're banking on the whole 75 coming in, in the form of direct deposit, it's not gonna happen. Um, <coughs> eligible employees. If you have an employee that's been without pay for 14 days from you, know, you as the eligible employer, um, in that period that you're claiming, they will not be eligible. They'll be eligible for the next period, but if they are you know, without work from you for that 14 day period in that uh, you know first period say then they won't be eligible and you have to you know get the wage subsidy for the next period for them um, you can hire back employees and pay them retroactively uh, but you have to be careful and discuss this with your employees because if they were on the CERB um, and you retroactively pay them back to March 15th in order to get a subsidy uh, of the 75 percent they could have to pay back their EI or CERB and that may put them in a in a awkward spot. So I think working with each of your employees, running the calculation, does it make sense for me to retroactively pay them back, or does it make sense to just hire them back and now I you know get them for period two and three? Um, you you kind of got to go through that you know that calculation and discussion. Um, lastly, there's three different ways to apply uh, for the 75% wage subsidy. You can do it through. If you're set up with my account on CRA, you can um, apply through there. You can have your uh, anybody who has access to your account online. So, you know, your accountant, your controller, uh, they can do that. Uh, and if you aren't set up for my account and you don't have an authorized representative, such as an accountant doing it, you can use your T4 filing access code in order to file. You must apply by October of 2020 in order to get these wage subsidies. I'm not sure why you would wait if you need the cash, then I would apply now. Um, and again, I think I talked about the penalties uh, of being quite stiff. So just, you know, again, be very careful. And I would make sure that you have direct deposits set up in order to um, ensure that you're getting the cash as soon as possible, not being held up with snail mail. Um, that's pretty much the, the, the high level overview of, of these programs. Uh, just, just to reiterate, there's a lot of details in, in these, um, in these uh, programs that have been rolled out by CRA. So just be very careful in what you're doing and, and ask for help when needed because you don't want any unexpected penalties coming up in, in a year or two when, uh, when you thought you were okay. Thanks, Damon. That's, uh, that's really helpful. And uh, just to echo what you're saying, I think the approach to the government right now is high trust and high verification. So they will trust you when you submit the information, but they will verify it afterwards as well. So always best just to be to be ethical and true in, in your approach. And if you deal with them this way, I think uh, you shouldn't expect any problems uh, as well. Uh, I want to I want to switch things over and turn things to uh, to Denise, who's going to uh, join us and talk a little bit about the uh, the issues revolving around recalling uh, stamp from a layoff. Uh, those can be uh, somewhat complicated at times. So, uh, Denise, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Thanks, Damon, so much. That's helpful to put the wage subsidy in context. And so, part of what we wanted to talk about in this webinar today was, you know, the understanding the concepts of the financial side, and then taking a look at. So, what does this mean for employers coming back to business? So, when the wage subsidy process is um, complete and you know that you're you're going to receive some funds, then you're taking a look at. Okay, so what does it mean in terms of recalling your employees? So, recalling is a is a word from a layoff is a term that's used. It recall is actually related to em employees in a collective agreement to unionized environment employees who are not a part of a union actually do not have a right to be recalled. They don't have uh, any kind of recourse if you decide not to call them back from a layoff. So you have a choice here. Uh, you if you're non-union, you have a choice whether or not you want to bring your employees back. If you apply for the wage subsidy, you will need to bring employees back because you have to have payroll to qualify. 
Um, and so if you determine that you do want to recall your employees, it's up to you to determine what's the criteria, what employees come back uh, and to do um, either what work or to be put on leave with pay. Now, I wanted to mention that your recall criteria needs to be based on objective measures and it needs to be non-discriminatory. So you're not bringing back your, the people that you enjoy working with the most. You're not bringing back your best friends. Uh, you're not bringing back only the men. <laughs> you're being non-discriminatory in your practices. So you're taking a look at, is there work to be done? Um, maybe you're starting to do work differently and you have some work to do. And so the work will re will required will tell you which people need to do the work, which jobs are eligible to come back and work. Uh, or you need, might need a particular skill set. So it might not be your longest seniority person. Uh, it might be someone relatively new to your organization, but they have a specialized skill set that you need. And so you're recalling those particular people. Uh, you can move slides, Erin. Uh, now, there's a variety of scenarios to doing a recall. So you can bring everyone back to full-time FTE and salary, and you can qualify for perhaps for this wage subsidy, which will give you 75% of your cash to pay those people. And as an employer, you would then top up the 25%. And everybody goes back to full-time FTE and they receive their regular salary like they did pre-COVID. You might only recall some of your staff and you might leave others still on temporary layoff. Again, your criteria needs to be fair and non-discriminatory. You might recall and reduce people's pay because you don't have the cash flow for 100%, um, but the subsidy will give you uh, a portion of the money and so you're able to bring them back and reduce pay to some degree. There are some risks to that, so you wanna manage that, um, but that is an option for you. Um, and as Damon mentioned, you can recall your staff and pay retroactive salary uh, so that you might qualify for past periods that have already uh, come and gone. Um, and again, uh, taking a very clear look at what that means for uh, your employees uh, and having communication and conversations because they may have been receiving CERB or EI and they would be in an overpayment situation in that case. Uh, now, it's always important when you're bringing someone back to work to document what's happening. So we want to make sure that you're um, identifying the conditions, even if the conditions are unchanged. You still want to do a letter, uh, a memo, something to the employee that documents um, that they're returning to work, uh, conditions are unchanged. Or if you have to ha change a condition of work and condition of their employment, being very clear on what the conditions are that have changed uh, and so that they are fully informed as an employee about what's different. Make sure that you get a documentation signed by the employee. Uh, sometimes get well in, in today's world with the uh, physical distancing signature might be a return email that says I've read and agree with the terms and conditions you've provided me in writing. So it can be an email back exchange back and forth if you're not able to get a physical signature. Um, there, if you are making reductions in terms of conditions, be aware of the risks. There, um, you can run the risk of being uh, potentially down the line into a uh, situation of constructive dismissal or wrongful dismissal. Just want to really be careful and certainly talk to your HR professional uh, or to uh, your attorney um, about any kind of terms and conditions uh, that you might be reducing or changing. The other thing, Ari, I'm not sure, is there another slide there? Uh, yeah, and so there is a refusal to work, to work um, or refusing to return to work issue that might uh, come up for people. So what if you want someone, you call them up and you recall them to work and they say, thanks, I'm good. Uh, I'm making good money on CERB and I don't want to come back to work. Uh, well, in some cases, some employee, employers are actually using this as a criteria to determine who to recall. So it might be a criteria they decide if you're better off on CERB, I'm not actually going to bring you back to work. Um, it's up to you to decide whether you want to use that as a criteria or not. Um, employees who do not return to work can be deemed to have quit um, depending on the reason for refusal. Uh, now, if they're citing an unsafe place, uh, unsafe workplace due to COVID, 
then you cannot terminate them. Uh, you need to investigate. And so there's a whole refusing to work for unsafe work practices uh, through WorkSafe that you would definitely need to manage and to explore before you pursue the fact that they refuse to come to work and so they have quit. Uh, you would want to be very careful with that. Uh, the other refusal uh, component could be they're refusing to return to work because of your changes to the terms and conditions. Uh, and so then again, you would be very careful um, because you want to make sure that you're not uh, constructively dismissing them. You've changed the terms and conditions so dramatically that you force them to quit. So you want to manage and, and watch that as well. Um, the other uh, last thing I'll say before we move to questions is when you recall people to work, you are um, essentially, you might not have work. You might still be closed. You might still have very little work to do. Um, essentially, you're bringing people back to work. You're then putting them on leave with pay. And the pay is coming to you, the revenue to pay, make that payroll is coming to you through this, the wage subsidy. So it is, uh, it is odd, very rarely do employers put employees on leave with pay uh, and essentially they stay home and you keep paying them. It feels weird, um, it's not normal, but it is where you're taking the money from the subsidy uh, and you're continuing your employment relationship. And that's essentially what this wage subsidy is designed to do, is to continue to ensure that the wage is available to you, the wages are available to you so that you can continue your employment relationship. And so you're doing that by bringing people back and putting them on leave with pay. Uh, so that's a really quick run through. We wanted to make sure we left time for questions. And so just a, that's really high level and quick, but wanted to oh. set some HR context to what does it mean if you qualify for the wage subsidy. Uh, thanks, Denise. I uh, appreciate that. That's uh, a lot of information between yourself and Damon to really uh, chew through. So I appreciate uh, all the, the wealth of information. Uh, I want to turn over to, uh, to some questions. And just to remind you, you can ask questions. Uh, you, can, you can raise your hand. You can, you can uh, also type in your question into the chat window. To open the chat window, just click on the, uh, the chat button uh, on the bottom part of your Zoom screen itself. Um, one of the first questions that uh, that I had was uh, was regarding the, uh, the additional payment that uh, uh, the government of British Columbia is offering uh, individuals a one thousand dollar payment, and uh, I, I know that uh, as far as the BC government is concerned, it is a non non taxable payment, a one time payment. Um, is that also true for, uh, as far as the federal government? Is the federal government going to uh, count that as a non taxable uh, payment to individuals? Honestly, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I have not looked into that that far. I've been focusing on uh, on these other federal programs and I haven't got into that. There's a couple other programs that were released. Uh, it's called the um, the BCAP program and, and a couple other ones that are uh, provincially regulated that, you know, for, for businesses as well uh, that, you know, they're we could get into and go on for hours, but I, I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I, I can find that out and shoot you a message. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. So, Eric, uh, can I just clarify, are you asking if the CERB is taxable? Uh, no, I know the CERB is. I'm asking about okay. the, uh, the payment that uh, British Columbia, the BC. government of BC is providing, $1,000 or one time payment. Right. I know that the, the federal, uh, the provincial government is not taxing that payment, but I'm not sure whether the, uh, the federal government will. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Denise, the next question is actually directed to you, and that is, how are we to go about legally asking employees if they are receiving CRB or EI. I've been advised that this is perhaps not our business. So Fair enough. organization basically ask your employees about their financial situations. Mm -hmm. uh, it, technically, it's not your business, and that's true. Uh, and it's really, it doesn't, you are not taking responsibility as the employer to make sure that your employees deal with any overpayment that they might end up being in uh, having received from the government. Your job is to make sure that they're, oh, excuse me, aware of the fact that you've added them to the wage subsidy calculations. And as a result, that might put them in an overpayment situation and provide all employees with the information on how to address the fact that they might be in an overpayment situation. 
and then it is, and you make sure they know it is up to them to manage that potential. And so then you're covering every employee. You're not trying to take responsibility for their overpayment. Uh, you've let them know this might be a reality and it's their job to deal with it. You might also decide not to do any kind of retroactive pay or anything that is dealing with the past. And you're only talking about the future with employees and saying from this date forward, we're putting you on our wage subsidy, which might in the future put you on an overpayment because they have to reapply for CERB um, every month. And so, um, or they report their income on EI, those kinds of things. So they would then know maybe I shouldn't apply because I'm going to be receiving my payroll. And so they can potentially uh, stop themselves from going into a future overpayment because they're aware of when you start paying them and when they have to stop relying on federal or provincial support. So it's more about the, being very transparent and very communicative with your staff about what you're doing and helping them realize what the impact might be for them, more so than asking about their individualized situation. Thanks, Penny. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of questions really relating to the same, uh, to the same issue or, or, or uh, the questions relating to the eligibility of, of uh, individuals who haven't been paid necessarily in the two week period uh, during the, the wage subsidy. Um, you know, when it was first announced, it was specified that employees had to work one of the last 14 days to qualify. Uh, is, is this still the case? That, that they had to have worked, they had at, least to have worked one. at least one of the last 14 days to qualify. And is this still the case? Yeah. Yes. It is. Yeah. Okay. I, and I, my understanding was that employees had to work 14 days, with, at least 14 days within any one period of the subsidy uh, qualifying periods. Is that, what's your understanding? I think, I think it depends on, on what, you know, what the time frame is that we're looking at, right? Like, are we looking at, you know, immediately the, the 14 days? Or are we talking, you know, I, I think we need a little bit more context to that question in order to formulate a correct response. Sure, I think that actually is a really good segue to the next question, which is very much related to that. Um, I'm gonna read that verbatim. Uh, for the 14 day break in wages for the Canada Emergency Whip subsidy, uh, that makes someone in ineligible. What if the employee worked in week one and week four, but had no earnings in weeks two and three. Can you confirm if this makes them ineligible? And to be clear, the CRA spreadsheets gives as an option to demonstrate that. Um, my understanding is, is that if the, the 14 day, um, the, the 14 day does include I think it's in f any 14 days in that period is my understanding. And that's definitely my understanding as well when, yeah. I, was, uh, when I was reading through, through the act, but uh, uh, I think that really the final authority on that is going to be CRA. And I think it's interesting that they do allow this sort of calculation, but it'll be interesting to see uh, what they actually have to say specifically about this type of situation. Uh, it's been an unusual situation, but it certainly can happen. Mm -hmm. The next question uh, also about the 75% wage subsidy, which I think is the one uh, that really ha everyone has a top, uh, top of mind, is um, uh, does anyone have a clear information on what nonprofits have to include or can exclude from revenues, donations, government grants, et cetera? It's a great question for a lot of organizations who really depend uh, almost entirely uh, on their revenue depends on donations. Um, I don't handle not-for-profits, <laughs> unfortunately. I, I don't have any clients that uh, that I deal with that. Um, I mean, I do know, uh, you know, from a society standpoint, um, I'm on the board of a, of a golf club here. And, you know, from a society standpoint, we were looking at, you know, sort of all the different revenues that we have because we've got a bunch of different revenue streams. And, you know, we had to, we just combined all the revenues in uh, to, to figure out was there an overall 15 to 30% reduction in terms of, you know, what that specific calculation is for NPOs. Um, I can, I can again, get that for you. Um, but I, I, like I said, I don't do any not-for-profit, so I don't, 
I don't know the answer to that right away. I'll find that for you and I'll send it to you and you can circulate. Jeremy, I appreciate that. And, and as being a non-accounting non professional, I do recall that they did specify that uh, our natural property organizations are able to exclude uh, those kind of calculations when calculating the, uh, uh, the wage subsidy. Uh, but certainly it's always best to, uh, to consult a, an accounting professional in that regard. Um, the next question really I think is, is, is more to uh, for Denise. Uh, once employees are back to work, what is our legal obligation to keep the workplace safe? Should we be doing a weekly health check there? So absolutely, when employees are back to work, uh, even if they are on leave with pay, it is always your obligation to ensure that your workplace is safe. And so you have... Um, uh, and we actually have two webinars next week about this. One is about the, all of the legal obligations of bringing people back to work on Tuesday. And the other one on Thursday is about uh, the safe workplace as it relates to work safe um, and risk mitigation associated with um, bringing people back to work, but also the mental health side of bringing people back to work. Um, and uh, because yes, as an employer, you have uh, an obligation. And so you will still need to make sure that your workplace is safe as you've always uh, had responsibility for, and you have obligation under a COVID uh, environment uh, and all the obligations under COVID to make sure that you are safe. So that will be include things like additional cleaning um, protocols, uh, physical distancing, maybe you're staggering your shifts at work so you've got less people in the office um, or in the environment. Um, maybe you are um, uh, making sure that uh, your bathrooms and washrooms are washed and cleaned more regularly. Maybe it's twice a day instead of once a week. Uh, just depends on your environment. Uh, but there will be uh, particular requirements under WorkSafe that you need to keep an eye on and um, be continuing to um, focus on while you are bringing people back to work. If you bring people back to work and you put them on leave with pay, um, and you are not physically together in any, in any way, everybody is virtual, um, it's always a good idea, whether it's legally required, I can't say that it's legally required, uh, it is always a good idea to um, maintain a level of connection have communication strategies, have uh, ongoing conversations, do check-ins. Uh, maybe managers are upping the amount of, uh, or starting to have one-on-ones if they hadn't had them before. You want to be in continual communication with your staff. You don't want to send them home and say, we'll call you when we need you, um, but you're still on payroll. Um, if they're on payroll uh, and they're not on, uh, they've not terminated the relationship, you have every obligation to continue the relationship, to continue to keep them safe, um, and to continue to do all the good management practices you would have done if they've been coming to work every day. Uh, and so you want to, and, and in fact, in some cases, you want to increase the amount of communication you're having um, and continue to uh, take good care of them in whatever way you can. Okay. Yeah. As employers are, sorry, Damon, did you have some? I was just going to say, I've got the answer for the, uh, for the charity. Oh. So it says, in the case of an eligible employer that is a registered charity, qualifying revenue generally includes gifts and other amounts received in the course of its ordinary activities. So the one thing I would just be cautious of is when they say generally, it's not always. <laughs> so <laughs> I would just be careful of that. Um, and then it just says if there's where it operates a related business, um, as just defined in subsection 149.1, the revenue from that related business is also included in the registered charities qualifying revenue. So again, case specific, but that's that's what is, is on the website under uh, qualifying revenues. Mm. Well, thanks for that, Damon. Yes, much appreciated. Um, Denise, you mentioned before about the responsibility of employers to provide a, uh, a reasonable, reasonably safe work environment for the employees. What would happen in this in a situation where an employer is taking those reasonable steps, providing a, a, a safe work environment? What happens if an employee says, uh, that's not good enough for me, I don't think it's safe for me, I'm not coming back to work? Uh, what, what are the options available to employers in that situation? Well, 
it's that becomes complicated and I think it's really important to have a conversation with the employee about why not and what is it for them um, for some people it might be you know they have a health condition that is um, putting them at risk higher risk than other people and so then you can walk down a path with them around understanding the health condition and taking a look at is there a way to accommodate that particular employee or do they need to actually um, separate themselves from the employment situation because they just it's not safe for them, but there's nothing the employer can do. They've done everything they can. The workplace is safe um, for a reasonable um, expectation. And so the employee themselves then has to decide whether they can continue to work there or not. The other conversation to have is about the fear and the stress that people are under in these conditions and in today's times. And so having a conversation perhaps about the fear that the person feels and helping them understand what have you done to make it safe. So just, you know, doing everything you need to do and then saying to employees, okay, we're good, it's safe isn't necessarily enough. You might need to talk to them about the fact that you're cleaning the washrooms twice a day, that you're physically distancing the way that you need to, that you know shifts are staggered so there's not as many people, and how you know that these things are keeping them safe. Uh, and so some of it is just de-escalating the fear that people feel um, and de-escalating them from a belief, rightly or wrongly, that they are unsafe. Because uh, right now, some people feel unsafe leaving their house. And it, there's nothing you can do about that uh, other than have communication, have conversations and help them see that you're doing everything you can to keep them safe. So it, it all comes down to communication. So that's a, that's a really good point also to, to remind everyone that certain segments of our population are, are far more vulnerable and higher risk. And we should always uh, uh, inquire really and talk to employees uh, to find out exactly what their specific circumstances are because and uh, not every not everything that's reasonable is reasonable for everyone. So it's just something for us to uh, always keep in mind. The uh, other thing I should mention in relation to that too is for employers to keep in mind, there is the job protected COVID leave under employment standards. So you might talk to the employee about them taking an, an unpaid leave for a period of time um, due to COVID. And so uh, because they are for whatever reason in their own circumstances, uh, feeling unsafe and unable to come to work. Uh, so there's a number of you know, potential accommodations or unpaid leaves or um, other ways that as an employer, you can work with them um, versus just ending the, the workplace relationship. Erie, um, just uh, following up on the two other questions uh, that you asked, the 14-day the uh, issue is, is, you know, 14 or more consecutive days in the claim period. So in that one-week work, two weeks off, one-week work scenario, if they meet the 14-day in that period, then they're out. But it, the way I read it is, is if it's scattered 14 days, then it's not consecutive. Mm -hmm. So I, I would think that it would then be in. Um, the key word really here is about it being consecutive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on, on the, um, from a general standpoint with, uh, and I don't have the exact answer on, on the, you know, is the, is the thousand dollar provincial one federally taxed? Generally speaking, um, when you have a provincial exemption, it's not federally exempt. And I'll give you the, for instance of when you get, um, credits for a um, if somebody's um, an apprentice and they get a fed uh, they get a provincial credit that credit becomes taxable for the feds so I would highly doubt that the feds would say don't worry about it as well um, especially in this time when they're going to be wanting to recoup a bunch of cash but again I'll, I'll get that confirmation for you mm. thank you that's a, that's a really good point and yeah I would love to learn that as well I'm sure for a lot of people would really love to know that um, one, one last question about, that I have for you, uh, and I think a lot of people have been asking me about in regard to the wage subsidy, was the, the other 25%. We all talked about the 75% that the government is subsidizing, but there is some, some discrepancy or some, some different thoughts about whether employers are obligated to pay that 25%, the remainder uh, of that salary, or whether they, uh, they are not. Uh, do you have any opinion on that, Damon? Um, my reading of all the stuff that that has gone through is that they're they're wanting you to to pay that uh, whether or not you're mandated to pay that like if you don't have the cash flow i'm not sure how how you do pay it right you know because there are going to be people that you know they just won't have the cash to do it so what that 
what the repercussions of that will be, I, I don't know. Um, the only thing that I've seen is that they are, you know, asking employers if they're able to do so to pay it. Um, I haven't seen anything that says if you don't pay it that they're going to, you know, rescind the 75% wage subsidy. Um, I'm not sure how the government could mandate that something has to be paid. Because um, if the cash isn't there, the cash isn't there. Mm. So, mm. I, I, again, I don't know how they're going to how they're going to look into this. It, this is a big spider web of <laughs> information and documents to work through. <laughs> Yeah, it's really a very complicated time right now, just trying to navigate through things. And what makes it even more difficult, I think, is that the government does keep moving the goalposts on, on a regular basis and changing things on a daily and weekly basis as well. So certainly what we know today might change very well next week and the week after. <clears throat> I think the one thing that we, we can count on them is to, is to uh, have a high degree of verification going forward uh, in the next year or two. And uh, for those companies that do survive and, and, and get through these difficult times. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time that we have only a few more minutes left, about three or four minutes left. I wonder if anyone has any other questions that they would like to, to ask either Denise or Damon regarding uh, recalling employees back to work, uh, the various federal support programs that are available to them uh, during this, uh, this difficult times. Um, I don't think that uh, there are. It seems like people are, have been all the questions that people have had uh, have been asked. Uh, uh, Damon, Denise, do, do you, any of you have any kind of closing thoughts that you want to impart on your viewers this morning before we let it all go? Damon? Um, sorry, I didn't hear I'm, that. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot just to find <laughs> out whether you have any some closing thoughts before we let it oh, closing go. thoughts. Closing thoughts are be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think is is just really the the name of the game here is, is be be careful be thorough and and have you know all your documentation ready for this and and when in doubt if you're unsure um, you know re reach out to uh, to a professional um, to, to make sure that you you do qualify and you're not putting yourself in a in an awkward position come a, a year or two from now thank you for that Damon. Yeah. that's really good good advice uh, Denise, any, any other closing thoughts yourself? Yeah, I would just say this is a tip of the iceberg in terms of all the different individualized scenarios that you have. So certainly all of us at Engaged HR are, are here to help. Um, we, as I mentioned, we do have two webinars coming up next week. Um, we're doing one on Tuesday, uh, just really talking about how, what are the safety requirements? How do you manage the safe bringing back to work, um, as well as, you know, all the different um, documentation, all the different components that you have to think about, um, just to help you think through the different um, elements of having doors opening again. Um, as we get into that, we'll see hopefully announcements from the province this week around what we can open up and so getting ready for that um, and then Thursday next week is our webinar about the um, legal ramifications and risk management associated with the workplace potentially being people's homes for the next you know foreseeable future um, if we decide not to bring people back into the office and we put people at home for you know, months on end what are the things we have to keep in mind and uh, a very strong focus on the mental health uh, components of that and how do we help people stay healthy mentally uh, when we are no longer in connection with people at work every day. Uh, so really looking forward to those both, both of those webinars next week because I think they'll dig deeper than what we were able to go to today because there's just only so much you can do in an hour. Uh, area of just I, I got that confirmation on the uh, the 25 percent so employers will be asked to attest that they are doing everything they can to pay the other 25% of employee wages. However, it is not required. So. Oh, that's interesting. That's well, this is, I guess where the, uh, the high trust and high verification will come into play in the future once uh, uh, Revenue Canada starts. Well, and the big, the big thing is gonna be the attesting, you know, so you're, you're signing off on this, you know, attesting this. So, you know, how they're gonna be able to go through and, and prove otherwise, I don't know. But if, if they do, you, you gotta be careful on, on the other amounts of uh, or, or where you're where you're putting your cash I think is is where you got to be careful right so are you taking management remuneration and not paying employees mm -hmm. that type of stuff are they going to shun upon that I don't know but oh, that's a really great point thank you for that Damon uh, 
Before we get going, I just want to uh, I want to thank everyone, and especially want to thank our panelists, Dan and Helen from CPCM and Co. Uh, and Denise Lowick. You can see uh, their individual contact information right on the screen. Uh, feel free to reach out with any sort of questions regarding accounting and bookkeeping uh, needs to uh, to Damon and his team, and and, and of course Denise I and the rest of the engage HR team are available for any sort of HR related questions you might have. Uh, thanks, Denise, for plugging in next week's uh, webinars. That's great. Uh, looking forward to seeing everyone there as well. Uh, I just want to remind people we are recording this session, so we will be sending out a, uh, a link to either recording uh, later this afternoon or early first thing this morning, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, so you can view this recording and feel free to share it with anyone else who wishes to learn more about uh, the various federal support programs uh, that are available to employers right here in BC. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank Much appreciated for having joining me. us. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.